Acts chapter 27. And I encourage you to grab a Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, you'll find a Bible in the pew in front of you. And then that Bible in the pew in front of you will be on page 1,328. That's page 1,328 in the Bible in front of you in the pew. And if you don't own a Bible, I would encourage you to take that Bible from the pew with you. And as our gift to you, I want everyone to have a Bible if they're able to. And so grab your Bibles that you brought or grab the Bible from the pew in front of you, page 1,328 in that Bible. We'll be in Acts chapter 27 this morning. I'd like you to direct your attention to verse number 22 of Acts chapter 27. In Acts 27, we're going to talk about this morning and look at uh, when there is a storm in the life of Paul. And often in lives, in our lives, in lives of people around us, there will be storms. But Paul comes to a powerful place and, and it makes a tremendous statement. And let's look beginning in verse 22 of Acts chapter 27, where the Bible says, And now, Paul speaking, and now I exhort you, be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, verse 24, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. And would you read those next four words with me, please? If you have your Bibles open. Now, for I believe God, that it should be even as it was told me. This morning, the Lord's help, we're going to look at and talk about and ask God to convict us about this simple statement that Paul made, for I believe God. That statement is not just good for Paul, it's good for everyone. Anyone who has trusted Jesus Christ ought to make this statement regularly, for I believe God. At the moment of salvation, we make that statement, for I believe God and trust him for salvation. But my friends, that statement cannot stop at salvation, it must start at salvation. At this moment, Paul has been saved for a number of years. Paul has seen the power of God in his life and the lives of those around him and those he's ministered to. He has seen those convicted, transformed, and changed by the power of God. And in the middle of this storm, when things seemed the darkest, Paul was encouraged by the Lord, and Paul encouraged others, and simply, Paul exercised faith. For I believe God. This morning, I'm going to challenge us to once again, or maybe to begin, to believe God. Let's pray as we begin this service. Lord, I'd ask for your help this morning. Lord, I need you as I speak to say those things that would be true to your word and be helpful today. Lord, I've tried to do my part and prepare and study, but Lord, now the burden rests upon you. I need your grace and strength, your spirit to, to speak in and through me. And Lord, in this room, I ask that your truth would be powerful, that your spirit would have freedom in here that you would hinder everything that would be distracting or those things that would and could cause the word of God to be snatched away from hearts that could make decisions for you, Lord. I pray that those distractions would be hindered and that you would receive the glory this morning. Lord, there are some here who don't know you as, as Savior, and I pray that today you would open their eyes and show them the light in the midst of their darkness. Lord, there are some here who are struggling, even though they are Christians, to believe you. And I pray that today you challenge them and encourage them with your word, with your power and spirit. Lord, may each of us, with your grace, be able to walk out and say, for I believe God. Lord, we give you the praise and glory and ask for help today in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled the message, Recalculating. This is what happens when you're driving down the road using whatever GPS poison is your poison of choice. And you miss the directions, or you ignore the directions, or the directions were flat out wrong. I am sure that in your life, if you use GPS on a phone or another unit, that there's been times when you've missed the turn that it says to make. Turn right 300 feet, turn right 200 feet, turn right 100 feet, you just missed your turn. Like I have, you think, how did I miss that? It's been warning me for the last hour and a half. There's a turn coming. And I'm sure if you use GPS, as I have, you come to the place where it says to turn right, and there's either no road 
or road closed. And you think, how does this thing not know that this road is closed? If you continue on your way, the GPS will recalculate. How many have ever had a GPS recalculate? How many, because of their stubbornness, have had to recalculate multiple times? Where you're sure you know a better way. What happens when God recalculates our mission, our plans? What happens when God takes the path that we think we're on and changes it, which is what happens here in Acts chapter 27? The destination is not changed for Paul, but the path to the destination looks a whole lot different than Paul imagined. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And these men, these soldiers, these, uh, uh, these shipmen had a path to get to Rome. And we're going to read about this morning. We'll read most of the chapter throughout the sermon. We're going to find out that though they had a plan and they had a path to get to Rome, God had a different path for them to get to Rome. Or God recalculated their journey. It was in British Columbia, in Canada, where two women were driving to Alberta using GPS for navigation. Because of an accident that had blocked the highway, their GPS, Google Maps at that time, suggested an alternate route. Not wanting to sit in the traffic jam, they quickly took the exit for the alternate route, going through a place called the Holmes Forest Service Road. These ladies exercised something that you and I would do well to heed spiritually, but not physically. They ex exercised blind faith in their GPS navigation unit. And while we should not do that physically, we ought to do it spiritually. Because God is our GPS unit. Well, they followed Google Maps. Twelve and a half miles later, out of cell phone service and stuck on a road completely covered in snow, unable to move, they realized that their GPS had led them down the wrong path. The only way they got out was that their phone had a satellite connection for emergency services. And the police were able to find them because they could call using the satellite feature on their phone. Do you ever feel that God has left you stranded on a snow-covered road and your life is stuck? Do you ever feel that you're following God and, and all of a sudden you look around and you're like, God, how did you take me on this, this exit? I was following you and now I'm in the middle of nowhere in my life or, or spiritually I feel in the middle of nowhere. The circumstances around me are, 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 are perplexing and, and troubling and trying Lord, I think you've recalculated my journey the wrong way. This morning, I want to look at what Paul demonstrates for us. Paul not only shows this throughout his life as a man of fearlessness and commitment, but a man full of faith. And you and I are called to be men and women of faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. We are saved by faith. We are called to walk by faith. Paul, in this passage, is going to exercise faith. He lives by faith. Faith is in following God is not seeing what will happen. That's sight. Faith is following when I can't see. Faith is trusting when I feel that I'm stuck in a snowdrift. And faith is believing God even when the storm around you is thundering and, cr and crashing and destroying your only feeling of safety. That's faith. When God has changed your map for his mission and he recalculates, do you still have simple, raw faith? I fear that as Christians... We suffer with faith. I feel that in America, the land of plenty, opportunity, 
and abundance, we suffer with faith. In a place where we should exercise more faith, because God has so blessed us, we actually often have less faith and lean to our own understanding and our own two hands. We lean on what we can see, on what we know, rather than God and who he is. Let's begin, look at this passage. We'll begin in chapter 27. We'll begin in verse number one. We'll read a number of verses. I want to read the first eight verses. So I want you to notice, first of all, that there is faith when a journey begins. Now, just to catch you up, if you have not been here the last few weeks, Paul has been on trial. He has been known to be innocent, but because he has appealed to Caesar, he must now go to Caesar. God has promised twice that he will stand before Caesar. So Paul is resting in the promise of God. He's going to make it to Rome. And now Paul is, is, we're going to find out, assigned to a centurion, Julius by the name. He's going to be put on a boat, and the journey to Rome is going to begin. And there's faith when the journey begins. Let's notice in verse number one. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners under one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. And entering to a ship at Adramtium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day, we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him a liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And when he had launched from thence, we sailed into Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Sicily and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. I want you to notice, first of all, that as a journey begins, that God does something for Paul. That I believe that God still does for you and for I. Now here we have it recorded in the scripture, and you may have perhaps caught it, but maybe not contemplated the truth here. It's found in verse number three, where this centurion let Paul go and refresh himself with his companions. Now, this may seem to be insignificant, almost a meaningless detail in the story, almost a side fact of what's going to happen. But my friend, I believe it's very significant that God would include verse number three for you and for I, to know that even though Paul has been in bondage, even though Paul is headed to Rome, he is going to stay in bondage. Even though Paul will stay before, Caesarea, uh, before Caesar, even though Paul will be on the ship, that God has put him in the right place at the right time with the right people. God knew exactly what Paul needed, and God knew that Paul needed to refresh himself. This was not done by accident. This was not done because Paul was begging. This was done because God in his, in his wisdom, God in his sovereignty knew that Paul needed some spiritual encouragement. Paul did not go to his companions, being allowed by Julius, to just go eat some food and, and have a time of refreshment like we would have after a service perhaps. No, Paul went to his friends and his companions to be spiritually refreshed. And my friends, you and I need spiritual refreshment, and God often uses people around us to do that. God often uses those Christians, those friends, those godly influences to spiritually refresh us. That's why it's so important to have godly friends in your life. That's why it's so important to come to church where you can find people who are like-minded with like faith because they can refresh you and encourage you. And God put Paul with the right centurion. Another centurion might not have let him go, but Julius did because God put him in the right place at the right time with the right people. And God will do the same thing for you. One of the traps of discouragement is isolation, pulling away. The Bible speaks how we can encourage and pray and bear burdens for one another. And this centurion allowed Paul to be refreshed. And my friends, God allows you and I to be refreshed in life with the right people at the right time in the right place. 
I can't tell you the times that I've received an encouraging text from some of you in this church, and the Lord knew that I needed just a little bit of encouragement. I tell you, every one of us can get into a hole. Every one of us. I'd like to think that I would never get in a hole. I'm the pastor. I shouldn't get in a hole, right? But I'm human. I'm human. You're a Christian. You ought never to get into a hole. But we do. You know why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. And my the encouragement that comes from a friendly smile from a fellow Christian who says, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I care about you. Anything I can do for you, can I just say, man, I sure appreciate what you're doing. The refreshment that comes from God's people is such a blessing. We can have faith that when a journey begins, God will put us in the right place at the right time with the right people. But then notice what happens in the story. They're back on the boat now. His journey has not changed. He's going to Rome. Paul's going to Rome. Look in verse number 9. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. I want to pause there real quick. If you were to study some of the shipping routes and the normal routes that the boats would take, during this time in the Mediterranean, and noticing that the verse said that the fast was already passed, if you were to com compare it to the calendar, you would know that the time for sailing in the Mediterranean would be between late April and late October. After that point, in early November and following, big storms, large storms will come and will harm the vessels. Because the time the fast was passed, we know that now it is not optimum sailing time any longer. They've missed the golden window of opportunity. Some have said that this was a grain boat, and there are some things that may lead to that thought, and, uh, and the grain would have already been passed, and so for whatever reason, that this boat was, was later on the season from the grain. But because of that, you could look around and had not been a captain of a ship and know that this is not the best time. This is not the, the best time to leave. And many of us can make those calculations as we drive or as we travel. Like, boy, I don't want to leave on February the 17th, the middle of winter in Michigan at 1 a.m. in the morning when there could be black ice and there could be problems. We understand that. And so now Paul sees what's happening and he shares something, verse number 10. And he said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with, uh, with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Pretty good advice. We're going to find out that Paul was exactly right. What happens when your advice, when your counsel is ignored? What happens when someone doesn't listen to your opinion? Because the verse, next verse tells us, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which are spoken by Paul. Not lost on me this word believe we find here in verse number 11, and then we find it again in verse number 25. Often we have a decision to make to believe those supposed experts or God. Now here, these, the centurion, he thought logically so, thought, I have a missionary here, a Christian, Paul. Paul's bent on a lot of boats, but Paul's not a captain. Paul doesn't know the weather. Uh, Paul doesn't work on TV5. Uh, what does he know about this? And so the centurion said, you know what? I know more than Paul, and we find out that he was wrong, but what happens when counsel is ignored? Remember this, my friends, there's still faith because God still works in the midst of human ignorance. You live a day in this world, you're going to be surrounded with human ignorance. Don't think that God can be so easily thwarted that just because your boss, just because uh, your employer, 
just because your coworker operates outside of what you think to be right, what you even know to be right, that God will be afforded. There is still faith when the good counsel is ignored. There's still faith that God can work in the midst of human ignorance. It was during the Revolutionary War. A loyalist spy appeared at the headquarters of the Hessian commander, Colonel Johann Rahl. And he was carrying an urgent message. And the message was this, that General George Washington and his Continental Army had secretly crossed the Delaware that morning and were advancing on Trenton, New Jersey, right where Colonel Rahl and the Hessians were encamped. The spy showed up at the headquarters to the colonel to deliver this message. But the colonel apparently was playing poker and did not want to be disturbed. And so he demanded the spy just write the message down and he would take it and receive it. And so as the account that I read, the spy did, in fact, write down what had happened, that George Washington had, had crossed the Delaware and the troops were coming. Now we know that that happened. We know the end of the story. And the spy passed that note to, to the porter at the door to take to Colonel Johann Ra. Apparently, as the account goes, that the colonel could not be disturbed. And so he took the note without looking at it and put it into his pocket. A few short hours later, Apparently, while he was still playing poker, General Washington and his troops attacked and overcame that encampment and truly, some would say, turned the tide for the war. The battle occurred the day after Christmas, 1776, giving the, colonel, uh, the colonists a late present and a major, major victory. And the whole time, the note was in his pocket. When human counsel is ignored, God still works in the midst of all of it. Don't be discouraged. Don't let your faith grow weak. Paul could have said, fine, you know what? God, what are you doing? I'm surrounded by idiots. And yet God could say this, but Paul, press on. If I can say to you, when surrounded by idiots... Press on with faith in God. We see faith when the journey begins, faith when counsel is ignored. But notice what happens in the story. Verse number 12, and because the haven was not commodious to winter and the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenix and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lie it toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they'd obtained their purpose, loosing vents, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against a tempestuous wind called Eurycliden. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. They weren't under control of this ship any longer. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quickstands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. They threw things overboard. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. This point, I can't see the sky. This is how they navigated the boat. Back then, they didn't have the electronics that we have. They used the sun and the stars to guide the ship. And here they are, they can't see anything. It's darkness. The ship has been lightened because the storm is so powerful and so strong. And now the general consensus in the ship is that we are dead. It's hopeless. There's no end in sight. We're going to be lost to a watery grave. And yet, Paul once again displays faith. Look in verse 22. And now I exhort you to be of 
good cheer. You see, God brings strength to stay on the course even on the darkest nights. When you're there and you don't see the sun, you don't see the moon, you don't see the stars, my friends, it's not time to quit. It's time to believe God. When the situation seems hopeless, when the night seems the darkest, when the ship seems at the point of breaking, my friends, that's when our faith becomes real. It's not real on the sun shining day and the wind is softly blowing the ship north or west where they're going northwest. The faith is strongest on full display when there's no sun, when there's no moon, no stars. When the waves are crashing over the ship, you've thrown everything out of the ship and life seems hopeless, that is when our faith is exercised, when a faith is on display. Faith, when life seems the darkest. What kind of faith do you have when it's dark? My friend, not faith when you receive the bonus at work. Not faith when God has granted some huge blessing. What is your faith like on the darkest of nights? the loneliest of nights, the hopeless situations. Where's our faith then? I read a little story about a parakeet. The parakeet's name was Chippy. Chippy the parakeet. Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. His owner was talking on the phone while vacuuming out Chippy's cage. As she tells a story, she has just said hello and whoop, and there goes Chippy the parakeet into the vacuum. Quickly hanging up, as she tells the story, she, with a gasp and an embarrassment, runs the vacuum, opens up the vacuum bag, and there Chippy is. She says, apparently shaking a little bit and covered in dust. Fearing the worst, she grabs Chippy the parakeet. I, I couldn't believe when I read the story. Grabs the parakeet and takes him to the sink and washes him off using cold water. So now Chippy has gone from shock to frigid temperatures. Worried about Chippy's life, she grabs a hairdryer and blasts Chippy with a hairdryer. And Chippy survives. Yeah, yay for Chippy. <laughs> you say, Pastor, why'd you tell us about Chippy? Because sometimes you and I feel that we are Chippy the parakeet. We feel that God has sucked us into the vacuum of life, seemingly forgetting about us. He's on the phone, distracted, and we are tossed and turned inside the vacuum. He pulls us out, rinses us off with frigid water, blasts hot air at us, and we sit there like, what in the world just happened? But this is why I share this. Apparently, a reporter covered this event. And the reporter asked the owner how the bird was recovering. And this is what she said. She said, well, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits there and stares. <laughs> Your mind's like mine. I can just picture this bird. If the bird could talk, dear Jesus, don't let her come anywhere near me again. <laughs> but I wonder how many times, Christian, that's our response. Not walking by faith, not with a song of faith on our lips or in our heart. We go through this, this storm and this trouble, and we can't, with Paul, echo these words, be of good cheer. We just sit there and stare. We're not dead and we're not out of the race. We're still a parakeet, but we've lost our song. We're not walking by faith. We feel as if life's been unfair. We see faith when the calamity brings hopelessness. And we see faith when a promise brings encouragement. Verse 22, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. 
For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. God was gracious to many for the sake of one. 276 people, souls on this boat. Not one will be lost. Not for their sake, but for Paul's sake. God was gracious to many for the sake of one. There is faith when a promise brings, brings encouragement. This is now the third time that God has said to Paul directly, you will go to Rome. You will stand before Caesar. And again, God brings his promises. And my friends, there's nothing like the promises of God to encourage our heart. When we read again that God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That God will, will not leave us alone. He's not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. My friends, we have encouragement. And then we find faith living in victory. Verse number 25, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. What are those four words we started with? saying with me, please. For I believe God. Would you say it again? For I believe God. Say it one more time like you actually mean it. For I believe God. My friends, we could take those four words, and if we apply them and live them in our life, you will live a life of faith, walking and living in victory. The storm's not over. The storm's not over. But Paul is walking in victory. Because God has said, not a single man, not a single woman on this boat, not a single life will be lost 276 souls, they will all be okay, living in victory even when the storm is crashing because I believe God. Today, my friends, as you walk out this morning, I hope that in the back of your mind you can shout out from the depths of your soul, no matter what happens, I choose to believe God. Tomorrow when you wake up and the day looks to be like a normal Monday, you can still say, I believe God. When it's calm, I believe God. When it's stormy out, I believe God. I believe God with my eternal destination. I believe God with my everyday destination. I believe God. I believe his promises. I believe every one of them from the front of the book to the back of the book. I believe he'll never leave me. I believe that I can pray and access the throne of God. I believe God. I believe that he has not left me alone. He gives me grace to overcome burdens and struggles in my life. I believe God. I believe that if I follow his path, he'll make it work out all right for his glory because I believe God. Friends, choose to believe God more than what you feel, more than what you hear, and more than what you see. What we see seems real. But life is a vapor, and God is forever. What you hear seems loud, but my friends, God's voice can pierce the loudest noise. What you feel feels real, but God's encouragement and Holy Spirit can change how you feel. Our life of faith it's not a journey with the intention of arriving safely in a well-preserved body. But a journey of faith sometimes has a skid sideways, sometimes thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, what a ride. Choose to believe God with your marriage. Choose to believe God with your money. Choose to believe God with your sickness, with your attitude, with your bills. Choose to believe God in the midst of your struggles. Choose to believe God. If you're worried about the storm, you're not believing God. Choose to believe God. I don't know how God has recalculated your life. Maybe you're on the front end and you see the journey ahead. You're like, this is going to be a great ride. Not knowing that God has already recalculated the turns for you. My friends, today choose to believe God no matter what turns lie ahead. Perhaps today you're in the middle of a storm. Perhaps you feel like these sailors did that your ship is sinking right now. And it could be the ship of your marriage, 
the ship of your job or just the ship of your life. And you're overwhelmed, overworked, and, and you're just worn out. Choose to believe God. Choose to believe God. I love what Paul says. For I believe God. And that makes all the difference. Thank you.